scenes and adventures in the semi-alpine regions of the Ozark Mountains of Missouri and Arkansas, 1853, by Henry Rose Schoolcraft. Incidents of Travel, Chapter 3, Part 1. Number 8. I was kindly received by some persons I had before known, particularly by a professional gentleman with whom I had descended the Allegheny River in the preceding month of March who invited me to remain at his house. I had now proceeded about 1,700 miles from my starting point in western New York, and after passing a few days in examining the vicinity and comparing facts, I resolved on the course it would be proper to pursue in extending my journey further west and southwest. I had felt for many years an interest in the character and resources of the mineralogy of this part of what I better knew was Upper Louisiana, and its reported mines of lead, silver, copper, salt, and other natural productions. I had a desire to see the country which De Soto had visited west of the Mississippi, and I wished to trace its connection with the true cordillera of the United States, the Stony or Rocky Mountains. My means for undertaking this were rather slender, I had already grown heavily on these in my outward trip, but I felt, I believe from early reading, an irrepressible desire to explore this region. I was a good draughtsman, mapper, and geographer, a ready penman, a rapid sketcher, and a naturalist devoted to mineralogy and geology, with some readiness as an assayer and experimental chemist and I relied on these as both aids and recommendations, as in short the incipient means of success. When ready to embark on the Mississippi, I was joined by my two former companions in the ascent from the mouth of the Ohio. It was late in the afternoon of one of the hottest summer days when we took our seats together in a light skiff at St. Louis and pushed out into the Mississippi which was still in flood but rapidly falling, intending to reach Cahokia that night. But the atmosphere soon became overcast, and when night came on it was so intensely dark that we could not discriminate objects at much distance. Floating in a light pine skiff in the center of such a stream on a very dark night, our fate seemed suspended by a thread. The downward pressure of the current was such that we needed not to move an oar, and every eye was strained by holding it down parallel to the water to discover contiguous snags or floating bodies. It became at the same time quite cold. We at length made a shoal covered with willows or a low sandy island on the left or Illinois shore. Here, one of my Ugiogany friends, who had not yet got over his penchant for Grizzly bears returned from reconnoitering the bushes with the cry of this prairie monster with a cub. It was too dark to scrutinize, and as we had no arms, we pushed on hurriedly about a mile further and laid down rather than slept on the shore without victuals or fire. At daylight, for which we waited anxiously, we found ourselves nearly opposite Carondelet, to which we rode and where we obtained a warm breakfast. Before we had finished eating, our French landlady called for pay. Whether anything on our part had awakened her suspicions or the deception of others had rendered the precaution necessary, I cannot say. Recruited in spirits by this meal and by the opening of a fine, clear day, we pursued our way without further misadventure about eighteen miles and landed at Herculaneum. The next day, which was the last of July, I set out on foot for the mines, having directed my trunks to follow me by the first returning lead teams. My course led through an open, rolling country, covered with grass, shrubs, and prairie flowers, and having but few trees. There was consequently little or no shade, and the weather being sultry, I suffered from much, much from heat and thirst. For the space of about twelve miles, the road ran over an elevated ridge, destitute of streams or springs. 
I did not meet an individual nor see anything of the animal creation larger than a solitary wild turkey, which during the hottest part of the day came to contest with me, for I rather had previously reached, some water standing in a wagon rut. I gained the head of the Joaquin Creek before nightfall, and having taken lodgings, hastened down to a sheltered part of the channel to bathe, after which I enjoyed a refreshing night's sleep. The aboriginal name of this stream was Zwasha, meaning pin oak, as I was told by an old hunter whom I met. The next day I was early on my way, and I soon began to discover, in the face of the country, evidences of its metalliferous character. Twelve miles brought me to the valley of Grand or Big River, one of the principal tributaries of the Merrimack, in descending the high grounds, I observed numerous specimens of the brown oxide of iron, and after crossing the ferry, the mineral locally called mineral blossom, radiated quartz, of which I had noticed slight traces before, developed itself in fine specimens. The first mining village I came to bore the name of Shibboleth. At this place there was a smelting furnace of the kind called a log furnace. Here I first saw heaps of the ore of lead commonly found. It is the sulfuret of a broad glittering grain and cubical fracture. It is readily smelted, being piled on logs of equal length and adjusted in the before-named furnace, where it roasted till the sulfur is driven off. When desulfurated, it melts, and the metal is received on an inclined plane and conducted into an orifice, from which it is laid on the molds. From 50 to 60 percent is obtained in this way. Shibboleth is the property of John Smith T., a man whose saturnine temper and disposition have brought him into collision with many persons, and given him a widespread notoriety both in Missouri and Tennessee. I lingered along so leisurely, and stopped so often to examine objects by the way, that my progress was not rapid. I obtained some corn, bread, and milk at a house, and pursued my journey to old mines, where a heavy storm of rain arose. I took shelter at a neighboring house, where I remained during the night. The next morning I walked into Potosi and took lodgings at Mr. William Ficklin's. This gentleman was a native of Kentucky, where most of his life had been passed in the perils and adventures attending the early settlement of that state. His conversation was replete with anecdotes of perilous adventures which he had experienced, and I was indebted to him for some necessary practical points of knowledge in forest life and precautions in traveling in an Indian country. The day after my arrival was a local election day for a representative from the county and the territorial legislature to which Mr. Austin the Younger was returned. This brought together the principal mining and agricultural gentlemen of the region, and was a circumstance of some advantage to me, in extending my acquaintance and making known the objects of my visit. In this, the Austins, father and son, were most kind and obliging. Indeed, the spirit with which I was received by the landed proprietors of the country generally, and the frankness and urbanity of their manners and sentiments, inspired me with high hopes of success in making a mineralogical survey of the country. I found the geological structure of the country embracing the mines to be very uniform. It consists of a metalliferous limestone in horizontal strata, which have not been lifted up or disturbed from their horizontality by volcanic forces, but they have been exposed to the laws of disintegration and elemental action in a very singular manner. By this action, the surface of the formation has been divided into ridges, valleys, and hills, producing inequalities of the most striking and picturesque character. There are some forty principal mines in an area of about seventy miles by thirty or forty in breadth. The chief ore of lead smelted is galena. The associated minerals of most prominence are sulfate of barites, sulfurate of zinc, calcareous spar, and crystallized quartz chiefly in radiated crystals. I spent upwards of three months in a survey of the mines of chief consequence, noting their peculiarities and geological features. 
By far, the most remarkable feature in the general structure of the country consists of the existence of a granitical tract at the sources of the River St. Francis. This I particularly examined. The principal elevations consist of red cyanide and greenstone, lying in their usual forms of mountain masses. The geological upheavals which have brought these masses to their present elevations appear to have been of the most ancient character, for the limestones and crystalline sandstones have been deposited in perfectly horizontal beds against their sides. Feeling a desire to compare this formation with the structure of the country west and south of it, extending to the Rocky Mountains, and satisfied at the same time that these primary peaks constituted the mineral region of De Soto's most northerly exploration, I determined to extend my exploration southwestward. The term Ozark Mountains is popularly applied to the broad and elevated highlands which stretch in this direction, reaching from the Merrimack to the Arkansas. Having obtained the best information accessible from hunters and others who had gone farthest in that direction, I determined to proceed as early as I could complete my arrangements for that purpose to explore these elevations. Colonel W. H. Ashley, who had penetrated into this region, together with several enterprising hunters and woodsmen, represented it as metalliferous and abounding in scenes of varied interest. It had been the ancient hunting ground of the Osages, a wild and predatory tribe who yet infested its fastnesses, and it was represented as subject to severe risks from this cause. Two or three of the woodsmen, who were best acquainted with this tract, expressed a willingness to accompany me on a tour of exploration. I, therefore, in the month of October, revisited St. Louis and Illinois for the purpose of making final arrangements for the tour and obtained the consent of Mr. Brigham and Mr. Pettibone, previously mentioned, to accompany me. A day was appointed for our assembling at Potosi. I then returned to complete my arrangements. I purchased a stout, low-priced horse to carry such supplies as were requisite, made his pack saddle with my own hands, and had it properly riveted by a smith. A pair of blankets for sleeping, a small, short-handed frying pan, a new axe, a tin coffee pot, three tin cups, and the same number of tin plates, a couple of hunting knives, a supply of lead, shot, ball, powder, and flints, a small smith's hammer and nails for setting a horseshoe, a horse bell and a strap, a pocket compass, a gun, shot pouch, and appendages, containing a space for my diary, a mineral hammer, constructed under my own directions, so as to embrace a small motor on one face and capable of unscrewing at the handle, which could be used as a pestle, a supply of stout clothing, a bearskin and oilcloth, some bacon, tea, sugar, salt, hard bread, etc., constituted the chief articles of outfit. The man of whom I purchased the horse called him by the unpoetic name of Butcher, it was the beginning of November before my friends arrived, and on the 6th of that month we packed the horse and took our way over the mineral hills that surround Potosi, making our first encampment in a little valley on the margin of a stream called Bates's Creek. 